Okay. Okay, everyone, welcome to workshop number two on identifying and serving multilingual learners with disabilities, the guidance manual workshop two on comprehensive evaluation and determinations. And today we are going to try to provide information regarding variables to consider when evaluating multilingual learners, provide information regarding assessment protocols and tests, and provide information regarding determination of eligibility for special education and special services. And just a quick note on terminology. I know it's a repeat for those of you who have been with us, um, but we are now referring to students with a primary or home language other than English who are not yet proficient in English as multilingual learners, um, noting that the federal government uh, continues to use the language of English learners. We are choosing to use this asset-based terminology in order to emphasize the strengths and skills that our students bring to their educational environment. And just for those of you who might be new, the manual was developed um, in response to the needs of the field. A lot of questions came from districts um, regarding uh, students who or multilingual learners um, where there were suspicions of a disability. And we wanted to develop a clear process. So you can see listed here, all the people that participated in the process. It was a thoughtful process um, that took um, a few years to put all of this together. And the manual does contain all of the components that are listed here in great detail. Um, we try to make the manual user friendly. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's approximately 50 pages. Um, and so there's three pathways of evaluation. Uh, the first could be uh, entirely in the multilingual learner's primary or home language. Um, if that were being done, ideally it would be done with a bilingual staff member or with the assistance of a trained interpreter. I will also add that there are very few evaluation tools that are available in the primary languages that are needed. Um, so this is not often achieved in the state of Maine. Um, you can do it in both the primary home language and English um, if the bilingual testing is available. Um, it may require the concurrent presentation of test items and directions in both languages. And certainly if that's the case, the examiner needs to uh, spend time um, with the interpreter to explain how that process would work and what type of participation is needed from the interpreter, making sure that the interpreter um, is not providing any information that would be more helpful to the student other than the directions and the items provided. And then of course the third is in English only and typically that's um, how most of our districts are evaluating students at this time with a combination of um, pathway two. And just a reminder that um, steps one to three of the intervention process, as outlined in the guidance manual on pages six to 14, should be completed before the school team requests an assessment to be completed in a primary home language or in English. That there is a process and it's clearly outlined there and it's really important that um, everybody follow that. 
And that shouldn't be confused with a specific timeline of waiting to assess the multilingual learner, correct, Robin? Absolutely. Thank you, Leora. Yep. Okay, so some variables to consider when evaluating multilinguals for possible disabilities. You want to think about primary home language and literacy skills. Um, we do have students that um, come to us who have limited or no formal education, uh, and that certainly will affect um, their timeline in learning um, English as they're here in school, if they've never been to school. And so their unfamiliarity with um, being a student can um, affect their presence. And they have to learn that. And so that's important information that should be gathered in the intake process. Um, you want to Think about their language and literacy skills, the cultural factors that would influence test and school performance, uh, family history. Um, oftentimes, uh, it takes more than one interview with the family for families to disclose that um, there is a sibling um, with a significant uh, cognitive disability, um, particularly there's some cultural factors that play into that. And so there's some trust that needs to be developed before um, families want to share uh, information like that, um, educational history. And what is the nature of previous reading instruction? Um, there are some languages where <laughs> it's a total opposite directionality. So students are not reading from left to right, they're le reading from right to left. Uh, and so a teacher could, um, you know, who wasn't familiar with that might think that when a student starts going the other direction, that there could be a suspected disability. So all of that information is important. We will share these slides, Carrie. Um, they'll be um, posted, this presentation will be posted on the Multilingual Learner website. Okay, next one, Leora. Sorry, I was just letting somebody in. Oh, that's <laughs> okay. Little... Okay, here we go. Yeah. Okay. All right, so some other things to consider, um, maybe medical considerations. Um, the child could have a visual impairment or a hearing impairment. There could be developmental delays. There could be speech delays. Um, the child may be experiencing chronic, chronic illness. Um, if possible, it's a good idea to maybe talk to the parents about the child's medical history to see if there's any anything that you should consider as part of the process there as well. And of course, um, unfortunately, we know that many of the folks coming to our country have it, have um, been mm -hmm. exposed to trauma in, in some pretty uh, pretty challenging ways. So, um, you know, understanding that piece is is very is a very important part of the process as well. So, there are some assessment protocols um, and tests that are used in schools that are typically designed for proficient English speech speakers. And I am having such a hard time talking today, so just bear with me. I don't know what it is. Okay. So to reduce the possibility of identifying an ML as a child with a disability or determining a student does not have a disability, when in reality the child does, all correct responses in one or both of the languages should be accepted. So, you know, if you are um, evaluating with both the child's primary home language and in English, if the response is correct, you should consider it correct. Um, best practice requires that any non-standard administration of tests should be documented in the professional's report. Um, so if there is a speech pathologist who's giving some speech test itself, for example, um, then making sure that if the test is being administered in both languages, that that is noted um, in in the um, the report so that folks 
interpreting that information understand that. Um, and due to cultural and linguistic differences between the ML's primary home language and English, standardized test scores may not be the only data point used and must be regarded as only one part of the multifaceted evaluation. And I think that's really what, um, it, there's a lot of different parts and components that comes in with evaluating a student whose primary home language is not English. So there's a lot of different stuff that we need to look at. Um, we have a question in the chat box. Let's see, when we talk about not delaying evaluations for ML learners, all of this information gathering takes a lot of time. So I'm confused about the emphasis upon not delaying evaluation. Sometimes we discover, oh, that is a great comment. Um, what we were referring to is there used to be this, this um, sort of, I don't know, I referred to it once as an old wives tale, which, you know, um, there was this common belief that there was like a three year waiting period or a two year waiting period where um, somebody came into our country before they were, um, if they were suspected of having a disability, before they would be evaluated. And that's what we're talking about. That is not a thing. So, um, but going through the protocols in the manual through the RTI process, et cetera, is of course, because um, if we're questioning whether a child who has a different home or primary language other than English may also have a disability, we need to make sure that we're following all of the MUSER main unified special education regulation and IDEA protocols. So that idea of a certain amount of waiting time um, for just the multilingual learners, that's what we were referring to and that's not a thing. So hopefully that is helpful. Okay, dynamic assessment is something that is talked about in the manual. And we, um, as you saw, when we looked at who reviewed the manual before um, it came out to the field, um, MASS, the Maine Association of School Psychologists, was one of the groups that we asked to look at the manual, specifically the section about dynamic assessment, because that's something that um, some of us hadn't really experienced before or, or heard a lot about. So this is a supplemental approach to traditional norm reference and standardized assessment. So there are different types of dynamic assessment techniques, um, testing limits, graduated prompting, teach, uh, test, teach, retest. Um, of these in 2001, it was thought that the test, teach, retest was best suited for differentiating language differences from disorders. Um, and there's also this little blurb for some more information about dynamic assessment, um, because you need to make sure that if you're using the dynamic assessment techniques, that it's in compliance with MUSER regulation. Um, so in conjunction, in conjunction with standardized administration, dynamic assessment can be used as a method for obtaining more comprehensive understanding of a student's strengths and needs. And make sure that the way that you are administering that and using those techniques are aligned to the MUSER standard. Um, okay, so performance-based assessment. So this data is used to determine eligibility decisions. They should all speak be derived from performance-based assessment in the classroom, observations and information gathered from the parents and the guardians and other professionals. So just like any other evaluation process with, um, or RTI process with a child who you're questioning whether they might qualify for special education, you need to make sure that you have classroom data from the general education, um, the general education setting in order to, to go through that process with fidelity to make sure that all of those steps are being taken. Um, and that student's performance should be compared to that of MLs of the same cultural group who speak the same dialect and who have had similar exposure to and opportunities to use English. That might be challenging in some situations, um, but that is considered best practice. 
Um, and tests standardized on children living in other countries or in monolingual English speaking students may be linguistically and culturally biased and they could yield invalid scores. So that's something that got more added to come it. off of mute. So I'm going to mute. There we go. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well as, you know, one of the many variables um, that are part of identifying a multilingual learner with a disability. Can I just give, I'll give an example of, of that, that middle one with the um, comparative groupings. Uh, if you had a group of students who um, all entered at the same grade level at the same time with, you know, similar um, linguistic background and um, prior school experience, and they all had um, the same uh, course of a instruction at school and opportunities and you know there's there's a curve of achievement and with with the five students and then but within that there's one student that just is kind of like this um then then you're going to be looking more carefully um as to why isn't that student um you know got to going up with uh, their trajectory of achievement and looking more carefully. So that's typically how evaluators will look at that group. Um, and so if you're a low incidence district, there may not be um, a comparative group opportunity is my point. Um, but that's only possible when you do have larger numbers. So Melissa Franz put in the chat box the link to that um, to that information about not delaying um, assessments or evaluations if we suspect a multilingual learner. And I'm not sure that anybody really knows where that two or three year waiting period came from, but there are still pockets around the state where um, we might run into somebody who believes that. So, so that's why that's an important part of, of this presentation, just making sure right. that everyone's there. April, so for... April and I get questions um, from usually ESOL teachers saying, well, I'm told that we can't do an evaluation because we have to wait three years. And I didn't think that was true. And so we're addressing it because we do still get questions at the department about it. Okay, so thank you. So since MLs cannot be denied access to special education and related services due to the lack of appropriate test instruments and procedures, a continued and expanded commitment to exploring interventions and dynamic evaluation strategies is essential. Do you wanna say anything about that, Robin? Uh, no, I think it pretty much speaks to itself. Um... I think it is uh, critical that you have uh, trained uh, teachers that are working with your students. And I know, again, with our teacher shorted situation, particularly, we, we do have a shortage of certified ESOL teachers in this state. That is a challenge. Um, but uh, having an, an ed tech or an assistant teacher, paraprofessional, whatever term your district uses, being the only person that's providing English language instruction, um, you know, that would not be considered um, an appropriate strategy um, to be using to service that student. All right, thank you. Okay, so when we're talking about evaluations for special education eligibility, it's very important to ensure that tests, assessments, and other evaluation components are selected and administered to be neither culturally nor racially discriminatory, and ensure that tests, assessments, and other evaluation components are provided and administered in a language and form that's most likely to yield accurate information on what the student knows and can do academically, developmentally, and functionally, unless it's clearly not feasible to provide or administer. And again, you know, Robin talked about this in the very um, beginning of today's session. That can be very challenging, especially in the more rural parts of Maine. Um, so, okay, Robin, who just joined you in your lab? 
This is Moxie. Okay, I am sorry. I can't see a dog without. <laughs> and oh my are, goodness! We we are not uh, recording from home. Uh, <laughs> I had we had multiple duties away today, and she had to come with me, and she's a little unsettled. So I'm sorry. <laughs> No, no worries. I just, I'm, I'm like the little, you know, whatever, whenever I see a dog, I need to know its name. I need to say it's cute. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So I think you were going to talk to this Robin. Right. So in my experience, the CLIM is programmed to help the psychologists interpret standardized testing results um, with giving that consideration of the linguistic and the cultural load of the assessment. So it's something that um, the, the evaluation is done and then the evaluators use this um, CLIM, this matrix that was developed by Dr. Samuel Ortiz to help them uh, interpret a little bit more clearly about what might be considered um, a linguistic or a cultural um, piece rather than something that was cognitive. And so again, it's another one of those guidelines that evaluators use. Um, it doesn't determine a level of cognitive ability, but it just helps them to try to have a little bit more of an accurate picture when they're using um, standardized testing tools that are in a language that's not the student's primary language. So your evaluation components. Um, is that mine, Leora? I'm not sure. Okay. I, I can just go through it if you want. Sure. Okay, so the different components that you may consider based on what the variables are that you're looking at with those with your particular student, you could be looking at um, the team deciding to do a psychological assessment or a sociocultural assessment. Um, it's very important as much as possible to have parents and guardians involved, um, especially at those interviews where you may be asking questions about the medical history and things that um, you know, parents are likely to be the people who know about that. Um, educational assessments, you may want to do a hearing screening or a vision screening. Um, and teacher narratives, you know, getting input from all of the teachers who work with that particular student, including the general education folks, um, to get a, a, a robust profile of that multilingual learner. And of course, classroom observations. Um, in both the general education setting and in the ESOL setting to really get, again, a robust profile of how that child is functioning um, and you know, what assessments may be helpful for the team to make determinations. So again, this is more components that the team may choose to look at. So there could be anecdotal records, including entry language assessment results and student, student portfolio records. Or you could, um, the team could look at the child's adaptive behavior, speech language assessments, audiological assessments, or there could be other areas that the team um, is, is looking at or questioning that the child may have some, um, some skill deficits in. So there could be occupational therapy, physical therapy, and again, that medical information can be very important to know. And I'd just like to add that the Linguistic difference piece is particularly important um, when evaluating if there is a, a speech issue uh, because there are sounds that are um, not produced in other languages that we have in English or vice versa. And particularly with our um, younger children, ages three to five, there are um, several referrals to speech um, that actually are just a language acquisition issue. And so that's where understanding the linguistic differences between the languages is key. And um, as ESOL teachers, um, you may even have to be a resource to your speech and language pathologist, particularly if 
you know, it, this is the first experience that they have evaluating um, a learner who's a multilingual learner. Um, so just take a heads up on that. You can, um, you know, kindly offer it, um, to provide that resource to uh, the speech and language person if, um, you know, they need it. Thank you. Okay, so here is an excerpt from um, a U.S. Department of Justice and Department of Education Dear Colleague letter from January 7th of 2015. Um, and this is really about how important it is to include an ESOL teacher or representative as part of the um, the IEP team that is looking at what assessments are needed um, and looking at making a referral um, so that there is consideration of the primary home language as an asset um, that could be made prior to initiating the, initiating the reevaluation. So again, this is just really important that um, the team includes the ESOL folks who have that area of expertise that um, and help guide those conversations related to the linguistic differences at the IEP table. We, we really want to encourage a collaboration mm -hmm. between um, the special ed services and the ESOL services um, working together rather than being silos with one another. I mean, that's really kind of the whole point of this particular guidebook, right, Robin? I mean, exactly. it's about, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really about um, that overlap of multilingual learners and special education students and, and how to make sure that um, those students get their needs met and access to faith, to free appropriate public education. Okay, so in determining eligibility for special education and related services, the, the multilingual learner goes through the same process as any other um, student who's suspected of having a disability. So you would follow all MUSER and IDEA guidelines. So to determine whether the student is eligible for special education, um, consideration of their English language development must be given through interdisciplinary collaboration. The federal regulations governing special education programs require that students must not be determined eligible for special education and related services if the determinant factor is limited English proficiency or lack of instruction in reading or math. So, you know, if, if you're familiar at all with the specific learning disability eligibility form, it's that rule out piece, the, the piece where, you know, especially the school psychologist is really looking through those rule outs um, to make sure that the child is not being inappropriately identified because they have limited English proficiency or they haven't had the opportunity or have had interrupted instruction because of their life experience. Anything you wanna add there, Robin? Well, I'm just thinking that particularly for our older students who are SLIF, so students with limited or interrupted formal education, um, again, there is a tendency um, to say that, uh, gee, these students, you know, I think they might be special ed students um, when in fact they just have had, you know, no opportunity for any um, prior education or, you know, very sporadic. Uh, and so all the things we've previously talked about are so important, but I think um, it's, it's a bigger issue even um, with our um, older students. Okay, so um, just some discussion thoughts. Um, in preparing the evaluation report, the assessor should report all ad adaptations. And we talked about this in the beginning as well. So any time that there are differences in the administration of an evaluation, um, for example, when you're taking those answers in both the, the home primary language and in English, that really needs to be noted. It needs to be noted in the report if an interpreter was used and hopefully the interpreter who is um, assisting the person um, doing the assessment is trained 
in uh, the terms and such for education because you want to make sure that the interpreter isn't misinterpreting things um, and that there's fidelity with the evaluation. Um, scores on formal instruments should not be reported if the norms are not appropriate for the student being assessed. So instead, patterns of student strengths and weaknesses should be described and used diagnostically to support eligibility decisions. And if there's anything that a special educator is good at, it's looking at strengths and weaknesses and really identifying those for our, for our kids. Um, it's really sort of the baseline of, of what we do. Leora, there's a question from yeah. Anne asking, would percentiles be okay to report? Percentiles, you mean in the evaluation report? And you can unmute maybe and clarify for us. Oh, instead of saying, I guess, you know, if the child is in referral and the evaluation is being looked at for eligibility, it would really be a question of um, the assessor and um, the IEP team which scores make the most sense for the eligibility decision for that particular child. Um, and, and there's definitely pluses and minuses both ways, you know, as there are with anything. So I think you really would want to talk as a team and look at that report and make that decision together. Anything you want to add, Robin? Yeah, of course, Anne. Thanks for asking. No. All right. Okay, so here's some more um, regulatory information from user, again, based on IDEA. So the IEP team meeting needs to convene to determine whether or not the child is eligible for special education and related services within 45 school days. So when that parental consent to evaluate is received back in the SAU, that starts that 45 days. And it's 60 calendar days for children who are in CDS. So those three to five-year-olds who might be um, who might be being evaluated as well. So after the, um, the receipt of the consent for evaluation, that's when that timeline starts. And a written copy of the evaluation must be made available to the parents and guardians no later than three calendar days in advance of the eligibility meeting. So if needed, and, and you know, many times um, it will be needed that an interpreter should be included in the eligibility meeting because we need to make sure that the parents are able to understand everything that's being, um, being talked about at the meeting. All right, we've got some questions in the chat box. Okay, underrepresentation is is problematic you're you're absolute right absolutely right melissa and leslie and i think that's really um sort of the crux of what this manual is about you know giving some guidance to make sure that um multilingual learners are appropriately identified when they need the special education services to access tape um and not identified if they don't if if the um if the perceived disability is that you know they have limited English proficiency and that's not a special education um, issue so that's really what the handbook is about um okay however so, teachers can make referrals absolutely anybody can make a referral yep right absolutely right and then there's another question about um interpreted documents so right now forms. yeah Right now, the procedural safeguards are in six different languages, um, and we added, we added, um, oh my gosh, what are the uh, a special education term glossaries? Right. In seven languages, we added Portuguese to those translations. So um, Massachusetts had them on their website, and then we decided to be a great idea to do the same thing for Maine. So. Um, as a special services department, we went through and really looked at what are the important SPED terms that folks need to understand if they're going through this process. And then, of course, we consulted with um, April as well to really, you know, make sure that we were um, hitting everything. So those are on our, um, our website as well. So those are just the terms with the translation into seven different languages. Um, next to them. 
Okay, so it's time to make an eligibility decision to, to determine whether the child is eligible for um, specially designed instruction and related services. So there's three different forms that the team would fill out. You would, e you would either pick one or you might have more depending on the disability that you're questioning. So there is the adverse effect on education form. So that form is basically used for anything other than deaf blindness because that's considered its own category. And even under IDEA, don't have to do an eligibility form for that particular disability. Um, for specific learning disability, because that has its own form, and also speech and language disability, because that has its own form as well. So if the team is questioning OHI, other health impairment, if they're questioning hearing impairment, um, orthopedic impairment, any other disability, then you would use the adverse effect form. If the team is questioning specific learning disability, you would use the specific learning disability form and so on with speech and language. And of course, if the team isn't sure whether um, the adverse effect is more about maybe a speech and language delay or potentially other health impairment, you would fill out both of those forms. And those guide the team through um, the adverse effect piece. Like there's a lot of data verifications that are needed. Um, with standardized tests and evaluations to make sure that the team is using objective information to make the eligibility decision. Okay, so determinations. So the IEP team determines the student's present level of educational performance goals and services. So the student must receive both ESOL and special education services based on the student's academic and language needs. Language proficiency in English and in the student's home primary language should be noted um, in the present level of academic performance or functional performance section as it relates to the goals of the IEP. So for instance, if there were speech and language goals that um, were related to language, then the language proficiency would be directly connected to those goals. So it would be important to have that information as part of the present level so that the team um, is, is well aware of what the English profi the language proficiency of that particular child is. Um, and the ESOL teacher or other personnel with expertise in the second language acquisition process Again, they should be included as part of the IEP team for multilingual learners. They're another expert at the table to help guide what that programming looks like for that particular child. Anything we want to add to this one, Robin? Just to reiterate that it's not an either or, it's not yes. special ed services or ESOL services that the student must receive both services. So when you're looking at um, a student's plan of service, you, you need to keep that in mind. Um, and so it, there have been many questions that have come up uh, over time <laughs> where uh, it's, people think it's easier for students to just receive special education services? And can the special ed teacher just consult with the ESOL teacher once a week or something? That's not appropriate ESOL services, nor would it be appropriate if a student has an um, identified special need for the special education, unless the team deems it appropriate that it's a consult only service. Um, so again, it's that collaboration piece of both services. So there's a question in the chat box, Robin, that I think that you would be good to answer. And it is that one difficulty in situate, uh, pardon me, hold on, it, it moved on me while I was reading. Okay, one difficulty in, is deciding if the student should receive ESOL or SPED reading and math. Are there guidelines on that? You know, it's very student specific. Mm -hmm. um, you really have to, 
uh, look at each individual student's needs uh, and how can collaboration happen? It may be that the um, ESOL teacher um, works with the special education teacher together in providing services um, for that student at various times. Um, and, and that's acceptable, okay, for a co-teaching situation. Okay, so what about situations when students with a disability are unable to test out of, of multi, uh, ELL and have been trying for, year, for many years? I guess I'm not clear, Leslie, about what, oh, because, are you saying because of their disability that... Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, I'm, they're I'm unable to test out. I can, talk to you. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about I've got quite a few students who have been identified as students with special education needs for a long time. Um, and they've been receiving e or multilingual learner, learner supports for a long time too, but they've really plateaued in terms of the access scores. And you know, it is clear in most of these situations that the student has a disability and that that disability is uh, impacting their ability to test out of the access. In that situation, you know, what, how do we have to provide ELL services or multilingual language services? Because it's just doesn't seem like that is an issue anymore. You know, they're, if they're well, and it's usually it, the reading that they can't test out of. Right, and and really, um, those students are most likely on a different timeline um, as their disability is impacting um, their learning timeline. Uh, so they, um, it, it may not be surprising that they would need the support of the ESOL program and to have. Uh, the skills uh, repeated and presented in a variety of ways uh, and have more practice time uh, with the various skills. So yes, they, they do need to continue with those services. Pardon me, um, this is Molly Callahan from Deering High School in Portland. I have a follow-up question to that. We're told by one of our special education colleagues here at Deering that um, she used to work in California and California has a process by which a dual identified student can, um, after a certain period of time, be exempted from the test essentially. So like what happens at uh, Deering is we have kids who have been born in Portland and been in Portland public schools, kindergarten, you know, from even pre-K. And here they are in 11th grade and they've had to take the access test every single year. It just seems kind of cruel to put the kids through this so many times. I wonder whether the state has considered capping the number of times that the student has to sit through this multi-hour test. And it's, you know, if the student has been receiving services for, um, you know, five, six, seven or more years, would there not be room for some kind of like mercy rule regarding the administration of the access? Is this student taking the, are these students taking the alternate access test? No, no, they were talking about general education students who might have a, a learning disability and you know, they're like resource room level students. That, I mean, we have, we have quite a few students who meet that profile here in Portland. At so the high school I, level. I wish that um, Jody Basio Smith, our director of assessments, um, was here with us to help us with that question today. And um, I think that that is a question that's really important. And I am going to ask if you would um, direct that question to Jody. Could you repeat yeah, her I name? Jody, J O D I Basio. B O S S I O hyphen Smith. 
Yeah, Hi. and Robin, sorry, sorry. Those, are, those are the students that I am also talking about, not, not kids who are English learners and we can still provide services. These, some of these students really, it's even dubious whether they were ever English learners but they were identified early on just because mom might have written Spanish, you know, English slash Spanish to one of the questions or something like that. And then they, they're sort of stuck in EL world. Um, and I never want a student to go under the radar if they are really a multilingual learner, but I have probably eight students who are in this situation and they just take the test every single year. And it's not that they're improving their English, but they, they have a disability which stops them testing out of usually, like I said, the reading section. I think we can get some clarification from Jody. Carly, are you still in here right now? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. I put her name in chat and I'm adding oh, her email right now. You can read my mind. You are awesome. Yeah, so the Sorry, it's a little confusing. So I put her name and then I added her email, which is her first name dot her last name at main.gov. So it looks like I put her name twice, but really it's part of her email, the second one. Sorry. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So You're welcome. Um, yeah, so and we can also follow up with Jody as well. Um, but it it might be um she's actually out of state right now at a, a conference. So thank you for doing that, Carly. Um I'm seeing some some questions about consult in the chat box and it's scaring me a little bit because consult as it relates to special education is likely different than how it relates to ESOL. Okay, so consult as it relates to special education is a service that is on the service grid that would be aligned to at least one goal in the IEP. The ILAP, the um, Individual Language Act acquisition plan with the, the ESOL services in it, um, I have an example cut coming up of how to document that in an IEP so that all of the folks know that, but I don't want folks to start mixing up the consult because as we know, there's been a lot of confusion in the field about consult as it relates to special education. Robin, anything you want to add to that? And no, I just chime in that um, consult is uh, not considered an appropriate level of service. Perfect. In the Thank ESOL you. world. Thank you. So we really wouldn't be looking at any consult services for a multilingual learner on an IEP. Correct. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Carly. Um, and. Perfect. So we will um, we'll, we'll follow up with Jody as well. So we've only got nine minutes left and we have seven slides and I don't want to go too fast, but I do want to make sure that we get through um, at least the meaty slides. So when you're determining eligibility, it's important that the student has one or more, oops, we're missing an M there, um, of the disabilities defined in MUSER and those are based right off of IDEA that the disability adversely affects the student's educational performance. And that's what those eligibility forms will help the team do. The adverse effect is built into those forms. And it's literally like, if, if one A is yes, then go on to this one. And it's, they're, they're challenging because they ask for a lot of information, but they give you the instructions that you need to fill them out very clearly. And in fact, we also just recorded some PD, Carly and I did it about the eligibility forms. So if there is an adverse effect on the student's um, ability to access FAPE, free appropriate public education, that means that they would qualify for special education and related services. So this is the example that I was talking about, about documenting the ILAP in an IEP. So here we just have it in section six at ILAP, Individual Language Acquisition Plan. That plan would be used across all of the domains that the child is a part of, um, both in special education and in general education as needed. Um, and then the duration, I don't know why it wouldn't, but normally I believe it would uh, coincide with the duration of, an IE, of the IEP itself. There, I don't know that there would be a time when those dates would be different. Um, and the addition of the ILAP to section six just really ensures that all members of the student's team are aware of the plan 
and it emphasizes the importance of the child's access to faith. Oh, and case studies, there are case studies in the handbook as well. Um, but yeah, that's a great idea. And we can definitely uh, talk as a, as a team about doing some, some case studies as part of a, you know, a Zoom with folks as well, if people would find that helpful. Okay, so if a multilingual learner is not found eligible for special education services, then the school staff, the MSST, the MTSS team would continue to serve as a resource and provide support to both the student and their teachers as needed. And that cooperation really ensures that um, that ineligibility for those special education services doesn't result in an end to appropriate interventions or monitoring. So it's not like, oh, they didn't qualify hands off, we don't need to pay attention to them anymore, right? We're gonna continue monitoring them. And then if concerns persist, despite the interventions that are happening, um, then the school might consider reevaluating the student at a later date. I mean, that could definitely happen as well. Um, the previous slide, this is just in this, this PowerPoint. Um, if, you, if you want to email me, I can send it to you via email as well. Um, but yeah, it's just part of this part of this PowerPoint. And it's actually going into our IE team. So I'm on the Federal General Supervision and Monitoring Team. We are now called I Maine's IDEA support team. Um, and this is actually going into our IEP training as well, so that folks who work with multilingual learners know how to document this, um, you know, as, as just a normal part of part of the plan. Okay, Robin, are you, you're taking this one, right? Let's see, when am I taking this one? <laughs> April was <laughs> going to be here and something came up. So that's, uh, that's why we're going back and forth with this. So um, appropriate instruments and methods to use when assessing your multilingual learners. Um, really, you're going to use uh, your, uh, it really depends on the multilingual learner and if they have uh, enough language to access your academic testing instruments. At this time, all students taking the late bus should be headed Oops. to the If If not, uh, then you're going to have to uh, do a portfolio of collecting um, various academic uh, performance uh, representative of the different content areas. Okay, so more of your formative assessment. Um, each uh, evaluator uh, usually looks at uh, the referral and decides um, what instruments like sometimes they want to use um oh gosh help me leora tests where you don't have to use a lot of language uh, oh lord it's almost four o'clock i don't remember i know so <laughs> nonverbal yeah, not thank you yeah yeah the nonverbal test so quite often um as part of the evaluation process, they want to use a nonverbal test when, when looking at the cognitive piece of things. Um, and the evaluator will bring in um, sometimes an interpreter um, for the direction piece of that to be sure that the student understood what was being asked of them. Uh, and typically the evaluators um, will write a narrative um, explaining um, if there were linguistic challenges within uh, the performance items, or if there were cultural factors that see limb testing, um, there will be some uh, reflection about that. Uh, and the evaluator um, will try to, um, you know, present as accurately as possible what the um, evaluation has presented. And there are times when it is just not 
it's clear that there is an impairment, but it's that because of the lack of adequate standardized testing items, um, they can't say something one way or another. And so sometimes we see a lot of determinations come under other health impairment um, when that's the case. Um, but there's a lot of narrative and explanation that happens. All right, I just wanna talk, um, there was a question about what does the ILAP and the IEP as needed mean that the IEP determines the amount of, and that is not the case at all. Um, those of you who are familiar with an IEP know that as section six asks for frequency and you can't, once you fill something out in the left-hand column here, you can't leave any blanks in that row. So certainly as needed seemed like the easiest way. You could also say throughout the school day, um, you know, something like that, but that seemed like the easiest way to do it. But if you guys have other ways that you wanna document the frequency, we're certainly not married to as needed. Um, it was just a way to, um, to fill that in and make sure that it's a compliant section six of the IEP. All right, um, so we have one. So we have to consider both expressive and receptive language. A child may have conversational English, but their receptive language skills are lower. Yes, that is very, very true. Yep. Particularly with your academic language skills, they may have their social and um, language skills uh, and seem like they're doing really well and, and their social language may be age appropriate. Um, but their academic language skills continue to need support. They're not independent there yet. I know we're at four. Yep. Oh, oh we want to make sure that you know if you um, complete this survey, you will receive a little thank you with a link that will take you to a contact hour certificate. I know many of you had asked for that in the past. So we've tried to do it this way. And if you Take your phone and scan that QR code. It will take you right to it. So we'll give you a second to do that. Um, we do appreciate the feedback. We, we do try to use your comments as we create um, the next session. There will be another session in January. And I don't have my calendar in front of me to tell you the date. So there's, some, there's a couple of questions about the first session. How can folks get contact hour? for the first session? Uh, if you go to the, um, th there is a link for that one as well. And so and was if you- that in the PDF of that PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Yes. So check the back of your PDF for the first session. Right. All right, hopefully folks have this. Here is our contact information. Um, anything related to special education, I can probably get you an answer to. If you have very specific multilingual learner questions, I'm probably gonna forward it along to Robin in April. Um, but we are happy to answer questions that you may have and um, you know, to support you in the field with this really important work. Go back to the QR code, you got it, there you go. Okay, thank you so I, much, everybody, oh, for all the Carly. work that you do. I also just dropped the website where the previous recordings are from session one and uh, the guidance about the, I think it's about the manual. So if you watch that recording, the QR code would come up at the end. So you could get that link there too, if you don't have the PDF by chance. Right. Well, then Carly is awesome. She yeah. joined us only in July, and we, we can't imagine life without her now. <laughs> Thank you, Carly. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. All right, folks. I am going to stop share. Hopefully, there won't be panic about the QR code. Okay, and I'm going to try to figure out how to stop recording. <laughs>